this morning, we're going to do things a little differently. If you don't know, if you've never been here before, this is usually time where I get up here and, and say, turn in your Bibles, and you whip out your Bibles and your notes, and, and at least pretend to pay attention uh, so that I don't roast you afterwards. Uh, but uh, this morning, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, I you ever heard of a testimony? Like, you ever heard that word, testimony? A lot of you that grew up in church, you know what a testimony is. If you don't, that might be, you're thinking, are we going to court? Like, what's going on here? Are we going before the judge? But uh, a testimony uh, just simply means you are going on the record, right? You're, you're like, just so everybody knows, I'm going to go on the record for something. And, and when it comes to uh, a church testimony, it's you're going on the record to tell someone what Jesus has done for you. Right. And 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 this is I, I get really excited when we have opportunities to hear testimonies because um, you you guys are probably used to me telling you what Jesus does. Right. And, and I know that you all would never think this, but but there's probably a temptation for you to go. Well, of course, you would say how great God is. You're a, you're a preacher. You kind of have to. Right. Like that's your that's your job. And of course, I don't have to. I wouldn't if he wasn't. But but man, it is even more powerful to me when someone who is not the pastor, uh, is, is coming up here and telling you about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and really, um, there's no such thing as a professional Christian, right? We think we're going to leave all the, all the speaking and all the truth telling to you because you're the pastor and that's why we pay you the big bucks or whatever, right? But, but in reality, we are all, if you are a Christian here this morning, you should be prepared to share your testimony. You should be able to go on record, and it doesn't mean you have three points and a poem and an altar call every time you talk about Jesus, but you need to be prepared. That's what 1 Peter 3, chap, uh, chapter 3, verse 15 tells us to do. It says, if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And again, it, that doesn't mean that you have to answer every single question and defend the Bible and defend the all, all these things, get into a debate you know, with an atheist and, and, and prove them wrong. Like, that's not what God's telling you to do. He's telling you to always be ready, always be prepared. Because, and by the way, it's never when you think it never happens when you think it is. It's a conversation that you've had after a long weekend, and it's Monday morning, and you're just aggravated, and you and you go into work, and someone starts talking to you, and all of a sudden you realize you have an opportunity to share your hope. Or when you're going through a tough situation and your life's in shambles and you're, you're dealing with sickness or loss or, or, or all the other struggles that we can deal with. And, and then someone says, how are you doing that? How are you holding up? Boom. Perfect opportunity for you to share your hope as a believer. And here's the cool thing about that is you don't have to answer every question. You don't have to convince them that the Bible is real and that God is real. You just have to tell them what he's done for you. It's hard to cancel your testimony. They can't tell you that Jesus didn't do what he did for you. And, and so this is not a new thing. God has always wanted his children to do this. Way back in, in Daniel chapter 4, verse 2, it says, It seems good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. Seems like it's a good idea for us to do that. And so that's what's happening today. Uh, so when a couple months ago, when out of all people, Nancy Clausen walks up to me and says, Hey, Pastor. I, want, I think I need to share my testimony. Now, I don't know if y'all know Nancy. As a lot, some of y'all are new here and may not know, but Nancy, her husband Craig, and their whole family has been a, a huge part of our church for a while now and been a part of my life for even longer. And uh, one thing you need to know about Nancy is uh, she don't do this lightly, right? For her to go and take the microphone from me, that is not, because there's some people that will walk in and say, oh, what's your name? Okay, oh, you want to share your testimony right now. Like there's some people that just will, will do it right now in front of everybody. And if she was like a attention-getting prima donna or something, you know, I'd be like, Nancy, are you sure? But this is, well, I'm not asking you, Patricia, but, <laughs> but everybody else. Uh, no. uh, Nancy is probably the last person to want to do that. In fact, her and I don't want to steal all their blessings and, and, and oust them for the, for the blessings that they are, but, but Craig and Nancy both behind, would much rather be behind the scenes, would much rather be doing things for our church and to bless you without you even knowing it. But when, so when she said, I think God wants me to come up here and share a testimony, I'm like, well, that ain't in your comfort zone. Now, your bubble is here, and that's way over here. So I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you there. And so uh, we've been pray prayerfully looking for opportunities uh, for her to do that. And, um, and so I am really excited 
that she has stepped out in obedience and, and said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to testify, I'm going to go on record to tell you not, not what, because she has no dog in this fight. Do you, her, you being at a par, part of our church doesn't pay her paycheck, it doesn't do anything like that. She just wants you to know what Jesus has done for her. So why don't y'all give her some love and encouragement as she comes up here, takes the microphone and tells us how it is. Well, since he already introduced me, that kind of ruined my whole uh, thing. So, but uh, I go by many titles in my life. And one of the proudest ones and the most important one to me is that I'm a child of God and I'm a Christian. The second title that I'm most proud of is being Mr. M Mr. Mrs. Craig Clausen, <laughs> which I love and I thank you for. And on... May 3rd, we will be celebrating our 46th anniversary. <laughs> I have three wonderful daughters, Jennifer, who lives in Ohio, Tracy, who lives in heaven, and Patricia, who lives here. I have seven wonderful and extremely beautiful and gorgeous grandchildren. Our oldest, Robert, lives in heaven. Oren lives in Ohio, Xavier's here, Leanne lives in Ohio, Zoe lives in heaven, Leanne lives in Ohio, and Tegan and Caleb live here. I also have a wonderful niece and nephew who, who live in heaven who are Randy and, and Zara. So we've had many challenges in our lives. Um, I joined the Navy uh, fresh out of high school. Two weeks I was in boot camp. I had 12 years in and um, they diagnosed me with MS and I was medically retired. Our daughter, Tracy, died at six weeks when we were stationed over in SIG. And God showed us so much love through that event. Uh, it was hard enough that she died, but we had so many friends that were family to us there. The command was wonderful. They got us out. Because she was born in Italy, she had dual citizenship. Um, at 18, she would have had to decide whether she wanted to be an Italian citizen or an American citizen. And because she was an Italian citizen, the Navy kind of did a really nice thing and got her out of Italy before the authorities really realized because they could have kept her there. And that was a miracle for us. And then, uh, to give you a little bit of background on me, I was born and raised in Washington. At one time in point in my life, both of my parents were alcoholics. But I had wonderful grandparents who I know prayed for me every night. I couldn't tell you when I became a Christian. I, I was just always was. He has given us so many wonderful things. Um, during a 17-month uh, um, my brother died, my aunt died, my grandfather died, my grandmother died, and then in January, which is, it's really weird that I'm doing this in January because January is a horrible and terrible month for me as far as mentally. Um, my grandfather died the first of the year, two weeks later my mom died, and two weeks later my dad died. And needless to say, I wasn't in the greatest of shape. I was having physical problems that they didn't know what was going on. Um, shortly after we got back from all the funerals, I had my first commitment to a mental ward. That was the first of three, because I had major, major depression. And I can give you all the big words with suicidal ideations. But really, all I, I and that's what they, they named it. 
Really, for me, it's all I wanted to do is die. I wanted to be with my babies. I wanted to be with my mom and dad. I wanted to be with my grandparents. I wanted to see how our daughter was doing, how big she had gotten. But God got me through it. God said, no. No, I have a job for you to do. You have to be strong. I mean, God, I don't want to be strong. I don't want to be here. And then he brought so many wonderful people into my lives. Edie, who I don't know if she knows, helped me through a lot of hard times. It was right after Tracy died that we met. And she was my support, my love, my friend. She showed me how to, to move forward in times that I didn't want to move forward. But God has also given me some of the most wonderful signs and wonders in this world. I have gotten to be at the hospital and actually be in the delivery room when three of my grandchildren were born. Xavier <laughs> ruined it for the other three because he decided he didn't want to come out. And Tricia ended up having cesarean, so I actually didn't get to see them being born. <laughs> You're the troublemaker. Um, but I, I got to be there. Um, I don't know if any of you are real familiar with how military life goes. But for a married couple in the service, it's a 90% divorce rate. And then you throw on the death of a child, and it goes higher. And then you throw in all those other deaths, and it even goes higher. But by the grace of God and the love that he gave us for each other, for Craig and I, we made it through. And people go, how could you do that? Where do you, where do you get, get your strength? <laughs> it's not me. Because believe me, if I had my choice, I wouldn't be here. God gave me the strength. God gave me the strength every morning when I get up and my body is so hurting and I have no strength and I don't want to get up. You could do it. Because I hear God. I know when he speaks. And if you don't listen to him, who I got to tell for you on this one, it does not turn out the greatest. The first time Craig and I re-enlisted, um, we were lucky enough to kind of be celebrities and re-enlist on board his ship. We had an admiral that actually came in and re-enlisted us. Actually, at one point, he turned to ask Craig, because I was a higher rank at the time, <coughs> most of the time. <laughs> good answer, good answer. And he asked Craig, uh, who decides which one of us sleeps on what side of the bed? And of course, the whole ship's crew is laughing at us and everything. Um, but God was telling me the whole time, you need to get out. You have a little girl you need to take care of. No, 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 I got my career. I wanted, from the sixth grade, I wanted to be in the Navy. No, I got my career, I'm not, I can't do it. So as time went on, and Tracy passed away, and we became pregnant with Patricia. Back then, we still had a choice. We could still get out when we got pregnant. God said, get out, this is a good time, get out. No, 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 I don't want to get out. I've got my career. I'm, I'm headed for E6. I've got to keep going. Well, then God slapped me in the face and said, OK, you won't listen to me? Well, maybe we'll make some arrangements so that that does work out that you get out. And that's when I was diagnosed with MS. Now, God didn't give me it. The sin in this world gave me it. But he gave me the power to deal with it. I'm still up walking. I occasionally have to use a cane. I'm not in a wheelchair. I have most of my mental capacity still here. <laughs> it's, it's iffy on some days. It, it is really questionable. But the love that I have felt all my life and the guidance from him has kept me going. 
and it's the little things. Through the years, we have traveled all over the world. We lived in Hawaii, Alaska. That's where Patricia was born in Alaska. She's actually our Eskimo baby. Um, we've seen the natural wonders of the world. Been over the Alps. Been to, I don't know, seven, eight different countries in Europe. Have, I have seven states left that I haven't been in. Craig has two. So, and, and all the way he has blessed us in seeing the miracles that he's performed. We just had a miracle happen yesterday in our family. Um, Stephen, if you don't mind, I'm going to talk about you. Sure. Stephen's family is not a very close family, but they went to visit yesterday and they had the best and most wonderful time together with his family. That's a miracle to me. That's a sign. That's a wonder. The birth of my children and grandchildren were miracles. The Grand Canyon that we've scooted around many times, never actually seen it, but scooted around it, driven cross country, I don't know, 10, 12 times, got to go over the Rocky Mountains, got to see some of the most wonderful God-made sights in the world, and you stand there in awe and think, how beautiful is this? How wonderful that you have given me the opportunity to see this. Was out fishing one time in Adak. They had a little, I don't know, 35-foot boat, whatever. We're out fishing for a halibut and had a killer whale come up to the boat, go under the boat and come back up the other side. If that's not a miracle, if that's not God's beauty, what is? And it's just the little things. One of the best uh, gifts I was ever given, I was awarded a bunch of, well, meaningless stuff to me now while I was in the Navy. Awards, pats on the backs, blah, blah, blah. With all that, I can take five bucks and go to Starbucks and get a coffee. <laughs> um, but just to see, when, and I love the little ones because they have so much awe and they're so close to God and they can see what he does. And when I go outside with my grandchildren to play, pirates usually, <laughs> and they could take and go, Grandma, look at that cloud. It's so beautiful. How many times do we look up at clouds and say, what a wonderful and majestic thing God has made? And it's the little things that gets to your heart. And it's the little things that you know that God is there. How many times have we missed accidents because we were running late? And we were mad because we were running late. I want to get to wherever because it's so important. And you come up on an accident that you could have been involved in. That's a miracle. When your kids come home and they've been struggling with some subject and they get a good grade, that's a miracle. And the signs that God shows us every day by a smile or a hug or how are you doing? And when someone asks you how you're doing, be honest with them. If you're having a cruddy day, tell them you're having a cruddy day. Because if we don't pull together as a family of God, then we're not doing our jobs. If you see someone hurting, sad, Go up to and help them. Don't be afraid. You know, what's a little embarrassment if you embarrass yourself over maybe giving that person what they needed to get through that day? And we've had many miracles in our family. My brother Terry, a couple years ago, was diagnosed with four, stage four cancer. And we prayed, and God answered our prayers. He's cancer free today. And sometimes, and, I, and I, this is kind of important to me, when our grandson, he was uh, shot at an accidental, kids playing with guns who were smart enough not to know, smart enough to know better. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, God, please don't let him die. Please. And he died. 
And I was mad. I was mad. Why didn't you answer my prayer? And I just realized here in the last couple days that God did answer my prayer. I asked him to heal Robert. And he healed him. He's up there playing. Robert would always tell us, when I die, I'm going to be up there playing football with Jesus. And now he's up there. What better healing? He had the absolute best healing he could have had. He gets to be with God. He gets to praise him and sing his praise and be with him always. And that goes for all my kids and grandkids. And that's the one, most wonderful answer to prayer. And I will tell you, sometimes God just flat out tells you no. This is not going to happen. And usually when he does that for me, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to keep on praying. And he keeps on saying no. We were supposed to actually not be here. We were supposed to be living in Nevada right now. And the house wouldn't sell. And I prayed, and I prayed, please, help us sell our house back in North Carolina. Well, obviously, God knows a whole lot more than I do. And what is better for us, the house wouldn't sell. And so we get this call while we're out there one day. And, Hi, Trish. Hey, hi. I'm pregnant. You're what? I'm pregnant. You're what? <laughs> and me being me, I'm not going to miss my grandchildren being born. So we moved back here. The house was still ours. We got to move in. We settled in and kept the property out in Nevada because we were planning, oh, Caleb, we get a couple years older and we'll go back. Well, then Tegan was born. <laughs> and then we got the word. You're not going back to Nevada. <laughs> okay. Because that's why the house didn't sell. Because I have a beautiful daughter and her family living, oh, about from here to the wall from us. We get, we get the little tiny house and they get the big house. Because I don't want to clean that thing anymore. <laughs> um, and all the joy, and God said, you need to be here. And we're like, okay. Because really, North Carolina weather is not that great for me. As a matter of fact, I've had doctors tell me I shouldn't be here because of the humidity. It affects my MS really bad. But I'm listening this time, because I don't want to go through the other stuff I went through when I said no to it. So just listen. And sometimes what he wants you to do just seems absolutely crazy to our finite minds that can only think a couple years ahead or 10 years ahead or 15 years ahead when God sees your whole life laid before you. And he knows what's best for you. He knows what you need. He knows what you want. And he provides for what we need. And I'll tell you what, he gives us what we want, too. Because I always wanted a close family. I didn't come from a huggy family. We were pretty well, children should be seen and not heard. And meeting Craig and his family, they're all huggers. And I was like, <laughs> Well, obviously, you know I go around and hug everybody now, so, you know, God can change you, too. God can give you a heart of love. And the most important thing that we have to remember is the love that God has for us. The deep, overwhelming, can't understand why. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. Craig and I have gone through some really tough times. We've been close to divorce a couple times. And God just said, nope, not going to happen. And I'm going, I don't know about this. <laughs> but he kept us together through sickness and in health. And let's see, what else do I have written down here? Um, and one thing, 
that has always helped me, and I don't know, it could have been Randy that even said this, we're not made for this world. We're foreigners here. Our, our home is in heaven. And we got to fight battles every single day to make sure that we don't lose the love. Because if you have love, you have everything. Love is what brings us together. Love is why Jesus hung on the cross and died for us. Can you imagine that? As a parent, my heart aches for God. I don't, I, I don't know how he did it. I know what it was like losing my children. And God had to see him on the cross, cross suffering like that. And Jesus did it willingly. What more could we do? And we have to remember, to quote Jesus, we will do the same things he did and even greater things. Can you imagine that? Greater things than Jesus? And he says we can. And I believe it. So I'm going to end this with a kind of a weird joke that I, I just tells you how God does answer prayers and when we don't listen to him, how things can turn out. So there was this great flood down Louisiana, because they're always flooding. <laughs> and you got this guy at his house. And the water is coming up to the first level. And a guy comes with a rowboat, says, hey, come on, get in. I'll take you to safety. No, 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 I'm praying to God. He's going to save me. And it gets to the, the water gets to the second level. And another boat come, comes by. He says, come on, get in. I'll, I'll take you to safety. No, 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 the Lord's going to save me. And then the water gets up, and he's up on his roof. It's so high. And then a helicopter comes by. And they're yelling, hey, grab the rope. We can save you. No, 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 God's going to save me. Well, he dies. And he gets up to heaven. He goes, God, why didn't you save me? And God looks at him and said, I sent you two robots and a helicopter. What more did you want? <laughs> and that's the way sometimes we do it. We don't recognize when he's telling us, I will save you. Just have faith. And I was talking to Trish the other day about the, uh, having the faith of a mustard seed and you can move a mountain. Well, I think what stops us is we don't have faith in our faith. We have to believe in our hearts that we can do that. We have to believe that God can save those we don't think, we have been praying for years to save, and we don't think it's possible. Everything is possible with him. I'm still here. When I didn't want to be, and that's because of the support of a loving husband, a loving Christian husband, who has done so much for me for so many years, and I can't repay you back, but I love you very, very much with all my heart. I thank you all for listening to me, and I hope that something will help you out. And if you are finding yourself in depression, or just can't take whatever is going on, I'm here for you. I understand depression. Sometimes I've been in such a deep, dark hole I can't even see the light. And then all of a sudden, I feel this hand. And I get pulled up higher. See, you can do it. And I get pulled up higher. And now, well, this is how I, I always picture depression, this big hole. And the hole's over there. And I'm over here. And I'm still moving this way. And it's not me. It's God. God is the one that kept me around. God is the one that says, no, your family needs you. I hope, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. And I'd like to end it with a prayer. Dear Lord, please fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, that it will touch the lives that we meet, 
And I pray, Lord, for every Christian today that we are put in a position where we can witness to someone, even if it's just a smile or a hug or in the checkout line, when someone asks, do you need a bag, and they, your husband turns to them and says, no, I already have one, and points to you. <laughs> and fill us with your love, Lord. And I thank you so, so very much for allowing me to still be here and to do your work. Lord, I pray that you will bless Freedom Family Church, all the members and all the guests, and I love you. Amen. I mean, how, we just dismissed after that. That's awesome. Um, thank you, Nancy, for being willing. Um, and I think that the one thing that I have heard through her story that um, ties in, I didn't know it would tie in so, so good with that, that verse in First Peter, is hope. That's what Nancy has, hope. She doesn't have all the answers. She doesn't have uh, a perfect track record, but she has hope. And what she shared with you all this morning is hope. And so what I want to ask you is, one, do you have that hope? Do you have that hope? Because the same hope that's brought her through all that is accessible to you in Christ. That the same supernatural goodness and power and strength and and all that stuff that 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 you that Nancy has lived through that that by herself she wouldn't have possibly been able to do is available to all of us as well. And so, if you don't have that hope, that's something that you need to make a decision about. That's something that you need uh, to to receive. And and, and I, for those of you that have it, I need to ask you: Are you prepared to share that hope? Because some of y'all's stories will change somebody's life. So Nancy's story is very different than my story. And so she, I, I was so, what I've been praying was that, that what Nancy said this morning would reach somebody here in a way that I could not possibly ever because I haven't been in that situation. And that's how God works is he takes our stories, he takes our experiences, he takes uh, his goodness put on us in our, our own lives and he, he gives us an opportunity to share that. And we've got to start sharing that. If you, it, you know, yes, it, it can be a little nerve-wracking to come up here on stage. But you have conversations every day. And I think a lot of times in our own pride, in our own nervousness, in our own doubt, we say, I can't, I can't say those things because what if they reject it? Or what if, they, what if I don't say something right? But, but we have to, to be so motivated and, and so convinced and, have, and so faith filled that our story and our testimony, and it's again, not us, but it's Jesus and the example of Christ working in our lives, it could change somebody's life. It could change somebody's eternity. That story is available for, it was given to you. God has done the things in his life. He has brought you through the things that he has brought you through so that you can help someone else too. 1 Corinthians nine sixteen is where Paul says, he says, preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. Nancy wasn't up here bragging about all the great things that she's done. She was compelled by God to tell you about the good news. And, and Paul, we need this type of energy. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. I got to do it. I got to say, I can't keep it held in. I need to let this out so that the world can know and so the kingdom can be built. And so, so there, that's the two things I want you to take from this, you know, on top of all the things that God may have been speaking to you through Nancy is, is do you have the same hope that Nancy has? And also, if you have that hope, are you sharing it? <laughs>